Hi, fifth grade and anyone else who's watching. Um, I will be reading chapter three of Freedom Crossing today because um, that's what fifth grade is reading. So I hope you enjoy it. Chapter three is called A Bed by the Stove. Joel explained, what's happened to you, Laura? You've never been hard hearted. Come on, sis, said Bert. It's only for tonight. Laura corrected him. Tonight and all of tomorrow. You don't dare take him away until dark. Joel agreed. We'll wait until the moon sets. That's about 1030 tomorrow night. The boat is supposed to pick him up just before midnight. How are you going to get Martin to the river when you don't dare take him out the door? Demanded Laura. That's what you said. You didn't think that it was safe to even take him out the door. Now it isn't safe. The slave hunters are everywhere, but I hope by tomorrow night, they'll decide Martin has slipped through their fingers and they'll go back to North Carolina or wherever they came from. Joel stopped his pacing to stand behind Martin's chair. He put his hands on the boy's bony shoulders. If they're still around tomorrow night, we can make a dash for the river if we have to. But now Martin needs a warm place to sleep. Laura persisted. You ought to send Martin straight back to his master. Joel's brows came together. Then he took a deep breath as if to control his anger. Think a minute, Laura. How would you feel if someone owned you and made you work in the field and beat you? Slaves don't feel the way we do, said Laura with conviction. They, they're like children and they want to be safe and cared for, she appealed to Martin. Isn't that right? Some slaves feel that way, I guess, he said doubtfully, but I don't. I want to get all the learning I can and not have any master to tell me to come and go and fetch for him. Laura looked at him in disbelief. I have never heard any slave talk the way you do. I declare you must be a freedman. No, miss, except I just set myself free. Laura was indignant. You ought to be ashamed of yourself running away from your master. He'll be worrying about you. Yes, miss. A smile flitted across Martin's thin face. He's worried, all right. He's thinking to himself that seven, eight hundred dollars just flew right out of his window, and he's going to try and catch up with it. Martin pulled himself to his feet. Thank you for the supper. I'll be going, he said, starting for the door. Joel leaped forward and seized his arm. You're not leaving. Helpless in Joel's grip, Martin stopped. I'm just a pack of trouble for all of you. Laura noted the proud lift in his head. He had spirit, that one, but it would be better if Joel would let him go. He might even be safer out in the woods. She pulled herself up short. She should hope that Martin would be caught and taken back to his master. He might be whipped as an example to the other slaves. But after that, he would have a home and food and clothes the rest of his life. Joel pulled Martin back to, into the circle of lamplight. If you left here, you, we'd be in more trouble than we are now. You heard those dogs. They'd find you and bring the slave catchers back here in no time. Yes, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I sure can hear those dogs, said Martin. But they don't know where to go. I walked through so many streams today, they think their noses are playing tricks on them. They're getting nearer, Laura pointed out. What if they come to the house anyway? In her imagination, she could see the sheriff marching all of them away to jail. We don't have to let anyone in the house unless they have a search warrant, said Bert. Joel nodded, and no one's going to issue a warrant before eight o'clock this morning. Seven, anyway. He relaxed his hold on Martin. Now sit down. Bert, can we find any other hiding place besides that secret room? I guess so, Bert agreed. Let's take a look, urged Joel. Laura studied Joel's face. He was determined to hide Martin here. Nothing she could say would change his mind. And Bert would go along with him. No doubt they thought that it was none of her affair. They'd start hiding fugitives long before she'd come back, and they didn't care a fig of her opinion as long as she agreed not to tell on them. Bert picked up the lamp. Let's try the cellar. Joel and Martin followed him, and Laura, left alone, was too surprised to protest at their leaving her without a light. She should return to her room, she thought, but she couldn't go back to sleep without knowing where Martin was to stay. 
Hastily, she followed the dim light that was retreating down the steps. The cellar looked as bleak as a dungeon. The windowless stone walls seemed to move closer as Bert lifted the lamp as high as he could under the low ceiling. Laura couldn't see a place where a person could hide. Maybe in the fireplace, Bert suggested. He, Joel, and Martin moved across the uneven flagstone floor while Laura trailed slowly after them. The four start, stared at the black square of the, of the fireplace opening. They always look in fireplaces, commented Joel. What about the oven? Bert pointed to a small door set in the fireplace while three feet above the hearth. Laura could remember seeing her mother open that door and slide in loaves of bread to be baked. Now her stepmother seemed always to use the oven in the kitchen fireplace. Joel peered inside the bake oven. I don't know. It's small. He looked critically at Martin. But so's Martin. Might do. Here, let's see if he fits. He bent his knee so Martin could use it as a step. Martin poked his head into the opening, but no matter how he turned or twisted, his shoulders wouldn't go through the doorway. Finally, he backed out, brushing the dust off of his head. I've been in some mighty small holes, but this one's just too tight for me. Well, Bert said, there's still the root cellar. Laura was amazed that in spite of the danger, Martin seemed to enjoy the search for a hiding place. He looked around the tiny root cellar with an air of satisfaction. Here were sacks of potatoes, carrots buried in sand, and barrels of apples. Before Laura could guess what he was up to, Martin snatched up an empty potato sack and popped it over his head. When he crouched down with his knees jackknifed against his body, the sack covered him completely. He leaned against the stacked bags of potatoes. How do I look? He asked in a voice muffled by the sack. Bert turned anxiously to Joel. What do you think? Joel chuckled. If I hadn't seen him get in, I'd have thought he was another bag of potatoes. Martin stood up and pulled off the bag. I'll stay here, he grinned. I won't get hungry with all these apples and carrots. It's too cold down here, Joel objected. Damp, too. How about the kitchen? Suggested Bert. If he hears anyone coming, he can get down here fast. I know he can use that for a bed. Thrusting the lamp into Joel's hands, Bert ran across the cellar and took the stairs to the kitchen, three at a time. Laura started after him, but Joel waited. Wait, Laura. She paused and he caught up with her. Let's not fight with each other about this, he begged. I can understand how you feel. Up until now, you've only heard the slave owner's point of view for a long time. You ought to listen to the other side of the story. Laura gave him a level gaze. I've heard nothing else tonight. Joel laughed. You're right. They climbed to the kitchen and Martin followed them. Joel suggested thoughtfully, there's a book that might clear things up for you. Uncle Tom's Cabin. I have a copy you can borrow. Laura said scornfully, I've heard of that book. That, that woman who wrote it. Mrs. Stowe? Harriet Beecher Stowe? Joel said the name with a note of reverence. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Uncle Jim says that that book's made up, all of it. Nobody treats slaves the way they're treated in that book. Sometimes they're treated worse. In silence, Laura began to clear the table. She could hear her brother's quick footsteps overhead in the small attic that was above the kitchen. He soon came downstairs, carrying an old rag carpet. This used to be on the floor in Laura's room, he said, before she came. Our stepmother put down a new carpet, but this is old, but it's clean. Martin took it with a smile, declaring, a bed for a king. He folded it and laid it on the floor behind the cook stove near the cellar entrance. Dropping onto it, he gave a weary sigh. Joel looked doubtful. It looks comfortable enough, but with his eyes, he measured the distance from the rug bed to the cellar door. If you hear anyone at that back door, run to the cellar. He glanced at Laura. I wish Laura knew what he wished, but she couldn't bring herself to offer to give up her room. She had agreed to let Martin stay in the house, and that was more than she should have done. 
No matter what Joel and Bert said, it was wrong to break the law and dangerous too. She looked down at Martin, already half asleep, and felt a pang of sympathy for him. He was good-humored and patient and brave. Taking a candle, she lighted it from the lamp flame and retreated with it to the door at the foot of the stairs, where she stood uncertainly with one slippered foot on top of the other. She wished she could find words to make Joel and Bert and Martin understand how she felt. No doubt, they thought, she was mean not to give up her room. Finally, she said, well, good night. Joel and Bert echoed her. Good night, but Martin raised his head and, as he murmured. Thank you, miss, for letting me stay. Laura said gently, sleep well. In her room, she set the candle on the dresser. Where was the trap door, she wondered. Full of curiosity, she could not wait until morning to see the hidden room. She lifted the corner of the carpet, rolled it back, and on hands and knees explored the bare floor. There would be a ring or a handle of some kind to raise the door, she reasoned, and there would be hinges. Yet, though she examined most of the area of the room, she found no telltale signs. Perhaps it was under the heavy dresser or the wardrobe where her clothes were hung. At last, she smoothed back the carpet. Tomorrow in daylight, she might have better success. Downstairs, a door closed. Joel must be leaving. She went to the window that faced west, overlooking the side yard, and watched a tall shadow race across the lawn to the edge of the bushes. Joel's face shone white against the shrubbery. When he moved beyond her line of vision, she hurried to the front window in time to see him turn onto the ridge road towards Lewiston. Once he had been her best friend, she thought, as she knelt with her arms on the sill. But now they were miles apart, farther even than when she had been living in Virginia. Laura sighed and got to her feet. But just before she dropped the curtain into place, she saw someone move from the house on her left and hurry lightly down the roads towards Lewiston. Someone was following Joel. Oh my goodness. Well, make sure that you click on the next link to see what happens next.